Well, thank you very much for accommodating me. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, so I, we, we just released our East Asia and Pacific, Economist, uh, East Asian Pacific Economic Update. And I've incorporated some of the stuff that is fresh from the oven, uh, but I also tried to keep up with the, with the topic of, of, of this conference, which is fiscal soundness and sustainability in the post-COVID era. So to talk about that, first I'm gonna talk very briefly about the COVID-19 shock. Uh, what it meant in terms of the damage that it does in the economy, and uh, what was the fiscal policy response that, that the countries did during that period. And then I'm going to spend a little time talking about the fiscal policy challenges. So, to get started, yeah, uh, easiest way in economics to think about it is, is uh, basically a presentation of supply and demand. Now, what was uh, unique about uh, about this uh, COVID shock was that it was both a supply shock, which means that, you know, it put pressure on capacity and on output and it, and it, it made it harder to, to go out and produce things, but also it, it, was, it was a shock on demand, which uh, basically made it harder for people to, to go out there and buy things and hurt purchasing power. Now, this resulted in, in business closure and uh, loss of livelihood. So uh, it, it basically means that in those cases, just doing stimulus, like, you know, we're thinking, we used to think about fiscal policy can be ineffective. But fiscal policy is really needed to help households uh, and firms. Uh, and at the same time, monetary policy comes in and into this framework to help ensure the flow of credit in the economy. Uh, just to give you, I mean, you all know, but uh, basically to go back, uh, that even after, Two years since the pandemic started, many countries in, in the East Asia and Pacific region has no, have not been able to surpass their pre-COVID levels of output. And on top of that, uh, the, the COVID-19 led to declining employment and also exit from the labor force. Now, uh, the, this is the general picture looking over a period of two years. Uh, if you look at our most recent update, and if you basically have followed the news over the last few months, you see, okay, there are risks, but there's also a lot of good news in some countries. And actually what, uh, what we are seeing is that there is a slight, uh, I mean, there is a recovery in domestic demand because of lifting of restriction in COVID in, in some of uh, the countries. But at the same time, China, which recovered quickly uh, right after the pandemic, is now seeing a slowdown in growth. And actually for the first time since, uh, since 1990, we see China growing by less than the rest of the region. And that, that was quite a striking fact when we, when we put this data together. Now, when we think about the, the emphasis of fiscal policy. So during COVID within, and when the country is in a recession, that also can happen for other reasons, uh, you know, the idea of fiscal policy, we think the main model should be relief. So lifeline for people and firms. But, you know, as, uh, as that deep shock is passed, and then we, we try to move on, and then the economy moves into recovery state, uh, then we are looking more, or the fiscal policy should focus more at uh, targeted support, trying to think more about medium term policies, promote restructuring, increase productivity, and so on. And then when it goes on, it, it reaches the phase of recovery, and then we, we, can, we can think. Uh, we, we can think about, uh, you know, long-term supporting inclusive and sustainable growth. Now, uh, we also need to be careful because to give such a big role to fiscal policy, it means that uh, there should be increased borrowing to support fiscal expansion that can lead to financial instability. Now, during COVID, we saw that uh, there was a lot of support given to countries, but output gaps are still negative in many countries, which means that there is still need for fiscal support. And at the same time, government debt has increased. So the thing about uh, you know, fiscal policy, it's, it's kind of, the needs are still there, they were, they were large, they're, they're still necessary, but this fiscal, this fiscal space keeps shrinking. So one way that we, we started thinking, or many people started thinking, was that Hey, but maybe if R minus G is low, so if interest rates are so low and growth, especially in this region is high, uh, then maybe, maybe 
uh, fiscal sustainability is, is not a, is uh, is not a problem because you know we will be able to grow out of that. But our analysis, even before the recent developments with the increase in inflation and interest rates, uh, is showing that we should be careful because, you know, especially for higher and higher level of debts, the probability of debt reversal increases. So, sorry, the probability of an R minus G reversal increases. And when there is an R minus G reversal, then it means that, you know, the, the debt that was looked sustainable suddenly become unsustainable. Another way to say this is that, you know, as debt increases, growth is lower and interest rates are higher. Now, what is happening nowadays and, 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 and what are, what are the, basically the, the, new, uh, the, the new challenges for, for fiscal policy? Well, we know that, uh, that uh, inflation has been increasing. It, uh, it started from high demand in, uh, in, in uh, advanced economies. And then it was accompanied by, by a lot of supply disruptions, both in the global supply chains, and then by higher um, you know, food and energy prices due to the war in Ukraine. And suddenly we are in a situation where we are again under a supply shock, and uh, a lot of countries even in the region are seeing higher inflation. Some of them for a different syncretic reason, but inflation is increasing and is putting pressures upward. Uh, th this in turn leads to uh, capital outflows. So there is pressure on capital to flow out of the country. And if we see is, is this blue line here is basically uh, among, you know, the outflows are among the largest in emerging markets uh, compared to, to these episodes of high volatility. And uh, there, there is pressure on, uh, on currencies to depreciate as um, basically we see higher return in, say, in the US uh, you know, where interest rates are increasing to fight their own inflation and also because it is growing. So, uh, what we see in response, what countries are constrained to doing is basically to give signals to fight inflation at least, uh, even though they have problems with, with their domestic demand, they start to increase interest rates. So basically this, again, speaks to the reversal that, that, I, that I talked earlier, but it also, you know, makes uh, this fragile recovery uh, even more fragile. And we, we see that, you know, the sense of the interest rates in going forward is to go up. Now, as interest rates go up, at the same time, currencies depreciate, it becomes a problem if the countries have a high proportion of variable rate debt, right? So it does need to, to go forward. Basically, higher interest rates means a higher cost of their debt, means less for, uh, for, the, for uh, their in investment and public spending. At the same time, it becomes a problem if they owe a lot of debt in foreign currency, because just by an exchange rate depreciation, suddenly the value of the debt increases. In that sense, uh, you know, what we, what we are showing or, and what we found in our analysis is that uh, La PDR and Mongolia are, you know, among the the, the, the most exposed. Now, this is not to say that uh, all this necessarily happened because of the increase in interest rates. Uh, you know, those countries had issues with debt even before that, but the increase in interest rates and the depreciation, depreciation pressures are making uh, the situation in those countries even much harder. Now, what can be done? Now, going forward, we can think of a few things, right? We, we don't want to slam the brakes and basically cool off the economy while you know a lot of a lot of uh, people are suffering and also you know the recovery is also suffering but uh, you know there are ways to increase the efficiency of expenditure of uh, of expenditure and investment and just to bring an example for the country uh, during covid for example government assistance was not very selective of course they needed to to act fast uh, sometimes you know they didn't have the time and the means to to make sure that they only gave it to, to those who really needed it. Uh, but for example, from some surveys that the World Bank asked is that the proportion of firms uh, who said that they needed assistance, uh, so we, when you compare the, the, the group of firms that said they need assistance and the one that said that they didn't, didn't really need assistance, they were not doing as bad, then uh, the likelihood of, of uh, firms in each group getting 
assistance was about the same. So there was not really a lot of targeting. And some simulations that uh, our poverty team has done shows that when you really target, when you go and, and do a better targeting, for example, through this proxy means testing, then uh, the, the return to lowering po 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 uh, sorry, poverty is, is uh, much more pronounced. Also, we should think, especially in terms of, uh, of this environment of, of, of rising uh, cost of fuel and food, we should think of, of, of better policies uh, in response to rising cost of fuel and food. Now, what we mean by this, and this is something we cover in our update, uh, is that first, we, you know, a lot, a lot of countries are responding to, to these uh, shocks in food and fuel uh, by providing subsidies, price controls, but trying to keep the prices of, uh, of especially fuel fixed. Now, uh, this, we think, it, uh, it doesn't have the highest returns on poverty, and at the same time, it creates other dis distortions that will hurt, will add to existing distortions and hurt longer term growth. For example, again, some simulations done by the poverty team. If, uh, when looking at the case of Thailand, comparing the, the poverty elevation in, of, uh, between fuel subsidies and cash transfers to those in it, uh, the returns to poverty from cash transfers are actually larger. And if you do like a thought experiment and said, okay, what if the government allocated all the budget given to subsidies and cash transfers only to very targeted cash, cash transfers, then the return on poverty will be much larger, which is this uh, higher bar in here. Now, uh, again, looking at, uh, at other distortions that, that we could think of, we saw that uh, even though, you know, uh, many of the CAP countries were, were lowering subsidies on fuel right before the crisis, they, they uh, in nominal, basically as a share of the GDP, those subsidies became higher uh, once this crisis hit because they, they kept, uh, tried to, to keep uh, basically uh, support to keeping prices stable uh, rather than focus on consumers. Now, is this that uh, they don't know what they're doing or, or why is this happening? Well, there are good reasons of why this is happening. Uh, first, you know, the infrastructure for targeting might not be that perfect. And they know that this is not perfect. So they say we need some support through subsidies to, to targeting prices rather than giving all to, to those in need. Uh, which in theory sounds great, but in practice is much harder. Then is, is the political economy. So again, it's not, we have, uh, you know, these notions of poverty and we have people under the poverty lines, uh, but you know, when there is a crisis like this, where the living costs for all people are being increased because of uh, what's going on with, with, uh, with the energy prices, then it, it doesn't mean that the only people that need support are those that are under the poverty lines. Although people that are just above the poverty lines uh, also need support and, you know, through these um, ways of, of targeting the, the, the transfers, they would be left out. And the other thing, it, it, uh, the other reason might be more of a macro policy that, you know, they're afraid that if they let the prices fluctuate and focus on support, this will hurt expectations, which some countries have worked hard to make them well anchored. And, you know, this will uh, basically feed into prices. Now, uh, I, I tried to, to, to bring in, you know, some, some ideas that we had about uh, what, what is happening during this crisis, uh, you know, to the, to the likelihood of people to invest in, uh, or to governments to, to invest in uh, uh, clean forms of energy. And basically we started by, you know, what would be like the cost, this is like a unit cost to investing in existing, in existing coal or going, uh, for example, to expanding to new coal. And then this, is, this was prices before the war in Ukraine. And this is how, you know, they, they look uh, nowadays, right? Now, if you think, if you compare this with the cost of, uh, uh, you know, investing in new winds or new solar, uh, especially these two, it's our focus. It seems like, oh, you know, well, actually, maybe this is not such a, such a bad thing that uh, price of coals are, are going up because you know we can we can go back to 
we can basically, uh, this will make us go faster to, to cleaner energy. Uh, but actually, it's not right there yet. I mean, at, at uh, plausible parameters, uh, at a simulation de dependent on what, uh, you know, the costs are nowadays. If you think that uh, maintaining the new wind and new solar, you need some backup, backup costs and, and uh, those backup comes from gas, then this, price, this cost will be higher. And if you think that you also need uh, needs financing, then you are like then borderline. And then you should think that you know maybe part of the of the of the macro policy tool is to think how to support investment in in this uh, in these new cleaner forms of energy. And you know uh, so if you, if we take the simulation literally, it can be through uh, uh, better access to finance to this new to these cleaner forms of energy, and then later on. As we recover from this crisis, you can think of uh, basically a carbon tax that uh, will, al will also, you know, give an advantage to, to the cleaner forms of energy. So uh, these were some more specific things we talked in this update, but also in the previous updates, we've talked about uh, introducing fiscal rules because you, governments need to keep the credibility of being fiscally prudent. Uh, and uh, even now it's crisis and it's hard to undertake reforms, but committing to future fiscal reforms is something that will ensure the markets and also will um, commit the government to thinking about how to be careful about spending and how to think in the future to, to uh, raise more, more, more revenue and, and do things more efficiently. And of course, you know, we should think about reforms to stimulate productivity. So I understand that it's been a long conference and it's out of time, but I'm happy to receive questions and to continue this conversation.